Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to give you a couple seconds so that everyone who just needs to find their seat can settle down and do so. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at this Wesco Annual Review. My name is Naledi Molo. I'm going to be facilitating um, the dialogue over the next two hours. Wonderful to have you with us. And one, um, number one, can I say this before we go very far? Congratulations to everyone for making it this far into the pandemic. Reality is we've lost lives. We've mourned. Um, some of us have had to very well fight for our lives over the past uh, almost two years. So to be here and to still be part of something is an achievement. So before we go very far, please, can everyone give yourselves a round of applause? So we've got some very important people in the room today because this annual review was so critical. This is a time when we move into a period of rebuilding. So let's acknowledge some of the people that are leading that path. Um, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements, one of them, of course, being um, former MACO member for Economic Opportunities and Assets in the city of Cape Town, Mr. Alt James Foss. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the mayor-elect, Mr. Jordan Hill Lewis from the city of Cape Town. Congratulations, by the way, Mr. Mayor. Acknowledging as well the uh, MEC uh, for the Minister of or MEC rather for Economic Opportunities and Finance in the province, MEC uh, David Mania. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, also acknowledging as well the chairperson of the West Grow Board, Mr. Michael Spice, Spicer, and of course we are joined, of course, by our keynote speaker. I am an absolute fan, by the way. I really am, um, by Professor Tuli Matonsela. An absolute pleasure having you here with us. And we have Mr. Solly Faree, the HOD for the Department of Economic Development and Tourism. Um, and of course, Mr. Chris Kirchhoff as well, an invited guest. It is wonderful. We also have Mr. Rashid Tufi, Chief Director for the Economic Sector Support in uh, the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, and Ian Bartz, Chair for Audit at the West Grove Board. It's going to be an interesting discussion. We're going to pave the way forward, hopefully. And I don't know if you can pick it up, but I'm an eternal optimist. And I, I, I wrote something for you today just to kick us off in um, with some energy of, of, of uh, positivity. This one says, every adversity, every failure, and every heartache carries with it the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. I'd love to claim those words as my own. I'd love to, but they, those are the words of Napoleon Hill. And I raise that today because I congratulated all of us for being here, but I also congratulate us for being here to help to repair all the damage that has been done moving forward. Uh, so I'm going to ask that we start the program immediately so that we get to the real meat and the juice of things. Uh, please put your hands together for our opening remarks that will be delivered by uh, the chairman of the West Grove Board, Mr. Michael Spicer. Thanks very much indeed, Naledi. Um, your introductions allow me to use that nice formula or protocol observed, so welcome to you all, except for one omission, and that is our new CEO, Renal Stunder, and I will say a, a few words <coughs> a few words about her in, in, in a couple of minutes. So this gives us an opportunity, it's our flagship event, both to look back um, and we will note some of the difficulties, but also the achievements of the past year to look around. And um, we have uh, that remarkable South African professor, Tuli Madonsela, to give us her take on matters South African, the way forward, some of the opportunities. And then we will also be looking forward at, uh, I think, the very real opportunities in the Western Cape economy in which it is the privilege of Westcro as an agency to participate, to help drive us towards that goal of inclusive growth, that is uh, economic activity that benefits the entire population of the region. So by way of a few preliminary comments, uh, just to remind you that Westcro is quite an unusual agency, and it's unusual not only because of its longevity, founded in the early 1980s, 
been around a long time, but also because it brings uniquely in South Africa the city and the province together, and it is a creature of statute. So that is statutorily what Westcro has to do, to work with its stakeholders, its shareholders, its funders, uh, in the interests of both the city and the province, the wider province. But then it goes one step further. There are other promotional agencies, both in South Africa and internationally, that do investment uh, and trade promotion. Westcro uniquely adds tourism. And we have found, and I think many others have come to the same conclusion, that the interweaving of those fields is one where we can add value, complementarity across sectors. Uh, so it is this unusual thing. It works collaboratively and it's dependent <coughs> on collaboration not only with the funders, stakeholders, <coughs> but also with business. So it is configured as a business-facing agency, and the board that I have the privilege to serve is dominated by significant figures in the city and provincial business, and indeed the South African business field. And it tries to run itself as a business-minded uh, operation. So we've had this really extraordinary year, something we could not have conceived. And what I think has been the biggest feather in Westgrove's cap is that it was able to pivot very rapidly indeed to conducting during isolation most of its business online. So it has not sat back waiting for things to improve. It's managed to conduct its trade, its tourism, its investment, its full pr promotion and all the other activities that it does using the power of uh, Uncle uh, Google, Uncle Zoom, uh, Teams, uh, Skype, and all the other technical um, things that we have to fulfill nowadays. And it has managed to meet and indeed surpass in many of the sectors the targets that we set in a happier and uh, less constrained time the previous year. Now, I'm not going to go through all the individual uh, achievements, those are set out in the annual review which you have. <clears throat> but let me just say that the configuration and the ability to adapt and be agile is also a function of what you see as the economy of the Western Cape, which is quite distinct in South Africa in that it is very much an open, export-oriented services and tech and new industry economy increasingly. Of course, it has old economy activities that are important and significant. But the investments, the trade uh, that we see come across the sectors of tech, health tech, BPO, that's business process outsourcing, uh, agribusiness, um, a wide variety of services, both financial and otherwise, and all of these interweave in a way where we are, I think, in some ways pioneering activities for the rest of the country. We are very much part of the rest of the country, but I think we are pointing the way. And we see that uh, in the green industry sector where the province is very much a leading one. So the investment promotion unit during this year committed a total of 17 investments to the tune of 4.37 billion rand very good during the difficult times. We operate the one-stop shop, which brings together a no number of government departments in facilitating investments, reducing red tape, and those have uh, brought to bear a total of 22 regulatory approvals. Export promotion unit has continued unabated online, on, online facilitated 66 export pr promotion business agreements to the value of 4,66 billion rand. So in total, West Grows had an impact of close on 10 billion rand with several thousand direct jobs. And I want to say a few words about that direct jobs issue in a minute. Export promotion um, learning through the training program that we do has also continued, not only in the city, but also in several districts of the province. 
and we have a district, a dedicated district unit that is also working very closely in a number of districts. The film and media unit, very hard hit by lockdown, um, has continued and remarkably, I think, has managed to secure bids and activity right in the heart of this complete lockdown where there were no international travellers and even the local industry was not able to function. Uh, we've also made through the Convention Bureau a number of commitments, secured a number of bids for major international conventions in the years ahead. Tourism exceptionally hard hit, as we all know, and regrettably and very sadly hitting employment creation and employment uh, very badly in the province. We have beavered away quietly, uh, setting up a number of frameworks, uh, promotions, films, which have won international and local awards for their creativity. Um, I think notably the One Day Tourism Campaign has won a number of international awards and was really quite noteworthy. Um, in sum, Westcro was the only agency that the World Bank recognised as a sub-regional actor in the COVID period. So we have got significant international recognition. Now let me say a few more words about this issue of direct and indirect jobs uh, and the multiplier effect of jobs that seem capital intensive and maybe at first blush uh, do not seem to have an impact on the lives of the majority of our people. So many of the investments facilitated in the last year and increasingly as we go forward um, will be in sectors such as tech and renewable energy. These are enabling sectors, meaning they enable the distribution and innovation and productivity across other sectors. So they have this compounding effect on the ability of the rest of the economy to, to operate more competitively, more pro productively. The halo effect of some of the big names that uh, invest in this area undoubtedly draw in others in their wake. And we have seen this in the tech sector where the big names that come bring others behind them. So these investments not only increase GDP growth, but they also boost labor productivity. This is a word we don't hear enough about in the economic discourse in this country. They power employment creation and enhance global competitiveness. Increased factor income distributed to households ultimately generates more consumer spending. So there's no doubt in my mind that whereas we focus on a few thousand direct jobs, the multiplier effect means that all the providers, the service industries, and the others that are touched by these big investments generate many, many thousand more indirect jobs right up the value chain. And therefore, they do touch the lives of thousands and thousands, in fact, tens and hundreds of thousands of the inhabitants of the city and the Western Cape. And we know that if we are to bring the fruits of our democracy, our market democracy, to the people at large, we have to do something about employment creation. We cannot live as a society with the high levels of unemployment that we have. And thus it is not an either or between investments of the sort that we know and the industries like Tourism, which is an export industry after all, but is probably the most labor-intensive, employment-intensive industry that we could have. These are complementary sectors that work hand in glove. The services provided by one can service the other. So I wanted to make that uh, point of emphasis because it is not sufficiently recognized in the discourse that we have in, in, in the country. So before I introduce somebody who really needs no introduction, <clears throat> I do want to say that we are delighted to welcome on board Renelle Stunder as our new CEO. She is, of course, a person born and bred in this city and this region. So she is delighted to return, and we are delighted that she has returned to bring the fruits of her very considerable experience 
both in the public sector and in the private sector where she has had careers across sectors and in some uh, industries that are directly uh, relevant to the work that uh, Westgro had. So this is an opportunity to sh uh, showcase your new CEO, to get to know her, and I look forward to what she has to say a little later in the program. But turning to, to Tuli Madoncella, it goes without saying that she is probably one of a handful of South Africans who has had a profound impact on the society in the last several decades. The seminal work she did as the public protector really has established a platform to regroup and to rebuild the society in a more ethical and a more sustainable way. She has now migrated into a new uh, field at the University of Stellenbosch, um, where she is a distinguished professor, but she is still giving very much to the broader public and in that respect, we are delighted to welcome her here today, Professor Tuli Madoncella. Greetings to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and a special greeting to the dignitaries from West Crow, particularly the man who invited me, Mike Spicer, and the leadership of the Western Cape government, among them the mayor-elect, Mr. Jordan Hill-Lewis, and the MEC, Mr. Menier. It is a privilege to join you, and I apologize. It's no disrespect that I'm addressing you from a cell phone. I had my speech done on the cell phone with intention to transfer it to my laptop, and then I didn't know, or I didn't check that load shading was going to happen at 10. Then the agreement was that I was going to use my new or somebody's new iPad. And some, somewhere between my colleague Di arriving and the assistant who was supposed to be part of me, the assistant decided now that my colleague Di is here, he wasn't coming, but not realizing that he still had the job of transferring this speech to the iPad, so I do apologize for that. It is a, an unparalleled privilege to address this gathering of leaders of the Western Cape business community that are devoted to growing the province. As we have heard from our colleague uh, Mr. Spicer, this has been going on for some time. The invitation resonated with me, given the work that I'm involved in pursuing at the Law Trust Chair at Stellenbosch University and the Tumor Foundation. We are committed to inclusive growth, and we believe that the answer to some of the troubles in our nation lie in our previous failure to grow together. We also do think that this is an amazing opportunity to mine the duality of adversity. And we heard from our colleague, Naledi Elia, quoting Napoleon Hill about the duality of adversity. And every adversity has within it the seeds of good fortune and misery. And it's up to your own leadership what are you going to mine for it. And whatever you choose to mine will determine your fate. And it does seem to me that Westgrove not only chose to mine 
the positive side of adversity during the height of COVID-19, it is continuing to do so, to look at how do we rebound in such a way that we do even better than we did before. So if you agree with me that the answer lies in growing together and mining the duality of adversity, how can we do this? I wonder if it occurred to the leadership of Westgrow when you were being established that one day you would find yourself navigating your ship and the country's entire ship at a time when the world finds itself in unprecedented times. You'll agree with me that COVID-19 is not the first pandemic to hit the world. Just a century ago, its predecessor, the Spanish flu or Black Plague or whatever you want to call it, devastated the world. However, you will agree with me that the context within which COVID-19 pounced on our lives is a far more complex one. COVID-19 hit at a time when our country, our businesses, our economies, and the world were trying to adapt to the fourth industrial revolution, climate change, and growing inequalities within countries and between countries. It was just after the world had adopted the UN Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 with the hope that by 2030, some of the most pressing challenges in the world would have been overcome and key among those being building more resilient communities, ensuring equality, ending poverty, and ending hunger. In our case, we were, as Justice Ngobo said in Batusta versus Minister of Environmental Affairs and Tourism, a country in transition. He said, we were a country in transition from being a country based on inequality to one based on equality. So when COVID hit us, its impact and the impact of the regulatory responses to it further exposed social, economic, and other fault lines in our social fabric and the economy. So ours is undoubtedly a world of heightened volatility uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. They call it the VUCA world. I do think, though, that VUCA is a myth. <laughs> because I do think that those who came before us also experienced a VUCA world. The, the term itself was coined in the 70s already, and therefore it didn't come with the fourth industrial revolution. But there is no gain saying the fact that ours is a more complex and fast-paced VUCA world. It is accordingly a new world that requires a breed of leaders that are brave and attuned to the pressing challenges of our time. It requires leaders who are capable and ready to lead themselves, organizations, communities, countries, and the world in a manner that ensures agility to the fast-changing operational context and resilience 
in the face of disruptions such as disasters and new opportunities such as the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So you'll note that I've mentioned opportunities as disruptions as well, because an unexpected opportunity can hit you hard. Let's look at what happened to us with the fourth industrial revolution. When Uber came, those who don't like driving, like me, were very happy. But those whose livelihoods depended on the taxi industry didn't know what had happened to them. And it required agility and resilience to get back on track. And COVID-19 has done the same thing to us. I was listening uh, earlier to our colleague who's running the airports company here in Cape Town about the impact of COVID-19 and the regulations that have sought to push back against it on movements within airports, livelihoods, and lives. So what kind of leadership is needed to navigate this brave new world? And what is the place of Africa's youth in this new equation? I'm putting Africa's youth at the center of it, not only because Westgro asked me to do so, but we are globally known as the youngest continent. And Agenda 2063, which is the Africa's strategic plan, it's something similar to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and our National Development Plan, asks us to mine the youth dividend for Africa's development. And therefore, it is important that we place young people at the center of it. In his cute little book titled Splitting the Arrow, Understanding the Business of Life, Prem Rowett tells the story of two ants that lived on two ant hills. You will forgive me, I like telling fables because that's how I was raised. I, there never was like in Greece an ethics class where somebody sits at the table and says, now we're going to teach you about life lessons and how to navigate life. It was always stories, it was always fables and uh, proverbs. And from then you learned what never to do and what to do. So in this particular little fable from Rowett, one ant lived on a sugar ant hill and the other one lived on a salt ant hill. This is not an advert for Hewlett Packard. <laughs> <laughs> so the ant living in the salt ant hill was part of a miserable community because can you imagine eating salt every day? And you can't eat much of it anyway. Uh, you can't eat to be full. You just have to taste it a little bit. Yeah. When he was very happy to meet this one from Sugar Hill, and the one from the Sugar Hill had glorious stories about the sweetness of sugar, which doesn't mean you should eat a lot of it. Um, and he was convinced that by his friend to come to Sugar Hill and he went to Sugar Hill. But figuring out that he might not like the taste of sugar, he took a lump of salt and put it under his tongue and then went to Sugar Hill. And he was indeed given sugar to taste and the ant from the Sugar Hill was eagerly waiting to hear what his friend was going to say about the sweetness of sugar. And the end from the salt hill said, no, it just tastes the same as salt. The end from, this, the end from the sugar hill asked 
the end from the sword wheel to taste again, to taste another um, spoon of sugar. He came back again and said, it tastes like salt to me. In fact, I'm convinced that salt is just another name for sugar. The, the ant from the sugar hill was perplexed. He then asked his friend, his new friend, to open his mouth so that he could see what is in his mouth. And there was this huge lump of salt in the mouth. So he asked him to spit it out and clean up his mouth. And then to taste the sugar. And of course, after tasting the sugar, the, the ant from the salt hill shouted with joy about the delightful taste of sugar. What is the lesson behind the story? Is like the old saying that whoever wants to discover new lands must be prepared to lose sight of the shore. The lesson in the story is that to grow, we need to let go of some of the things we know. We need to unlearn in order to learn. And in business, you call it a growth mindset. That, uh, yes, you must have goals, but you shouldn't have a goal mindset. You should have a growth mindset. There's a similar lesson in two books by Spencer Johnson. When you are faced with disruptions such as we have been faced with COVID-19, he writes in one book, Who Moved My Cheese, about a colony in a cheese maze where, in a maze, where in one part of that maze there's cheese and there's two people and two mice that exist there and they enjoy cheese that wasn't put there by them, but they think it's their cheese. Just as we built our factories, our homes, our lives around what we know until one day somebody disrupts it. And in this case, the cheese one day was gone. And when it left, the mice went and looked for cheese because they noticed that the cheese had been declining. In the same way as some companies noticed that the 4IR was coming when the first few companies started to invent tech solutions to the problems of water. So the, the mice went away and one of the humans eventually went away driven by hunger. The third human stayed. He kept complaining, who moved my cheese? But you already know that no matter how hard he complained, he remained cheeseless. As happened, as happened to us, when you complained, who moved our cheese with ESCOM? <laughs> I honestly blame myself because I once wrote an article. In fact, at the Pub Protector, even before I wrote the article, at the Pub Protector, I insisted on an energy security strategy. When the, the team said, no, 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 uh, um, uh, load shedding is gone, I said, we can have disruptions in the future. We need the strategy. I pushed until we did have an energy security strategy. So why I don't have one for my own life, I don't know. <laughs> but so we all complain who moved our cheese. We still remain cheeseless when it comes to, to ESCOM. There's solar solutions, there's generators, etc. In fact, if some of us went away and looked for better cheese, there would be less pressure on the grid, and ESCOM would be able to supply more people, but we all like politics, eh? <laughs> it's, it's easier just to complain. <laughs> but I, I've met businesses, though, that have moved out of the grid where a whole farm is solar powered. And whilst I'm complaining that I have to use this, they're not complaining. They're moving on because they moved with the cheese. But Spencer Johnson wrote a second book because people asked, what happens to the people who are not agile? 
because some of us are hemmed in, not because we're stupid, but because this, we've worked so hard to create the systems that we're involved in, and we can't just willy-nilly jump and go. So what happens in those cases? And Spencer Johnson wrote a second book, which called Out of the Maze. That's more or less where we are now, in this maze with COVID-19, 4II, climate change, inequality, and ESCOM. <laughs> so what do we do? Spencer Johnson says, after the two mice left and Ho, the one human Ho left, Ham stayed hemmed in, but hunger pounced. And he got so hungry and hungry and hungry until he felt really that he was going to die. And he stepped out of his comfort zone. And every time he tried to step out, he had heard these stories that it's dark out there and that people get killed in the maze. And he would go back. But eventually, on one of those days when he tentatively stepped out, he met another human being by the name of Hope. And Hope persuaded him not only to step out of that little corner of his comfort zone to Station C, but also to try food other than cheese. Gave him a round thing that turned out to be an apple, which initially, who didn't want to eat, no, him didn't want to eat because he only knew cheese. So what does that mean about a growth mindset and um, spitting the salt under our tongue? It means that we need to start thinking about dealing with the economy in ways different from the way we've always known it. The Minister of Finance is giving his budget um, mid-term, medium-term budget statement today. And a lot of people say the answer lies in less expenditure. I think they told that to SAA. <laughs> because if you only go for less expenditure, and then you don't invest in income streams, how are you going to survive? So I do hope that the Minister of Finance has spat the salt from his mouth, and the government has done the same, to make sure that we think about new ways of generating income for the country. But also what we said at Stellenbosch University with other academics was that it's not just about money, it's not just about economy, it's also about the social fabric. And the so-called eight days in July proved us right. We wrote in April 2020 about the need to look at our problem as not binary, but three-pronged, life, social fabric, and livelihoods. But I think we missed out on the social fabric, and mental health is increasing, education is a problem. And again, I'm not gonna blame the Minister of Finance, I'm not gonna blame anybody in government, or myself, because I'm part of this boat. It's just that they say failure is the best teacher, if you are a willing student. So it's our opportunity to reflect and say, none of us had ever experienced COVID-19. None of us knew exactly how the 4IR was going to unfold. None of us fully knew what the impact of one little transgression of en environmental degradation was going to eventually amount to. It's the cumulative effect that we now all see, but we have an opportunity now to, to ask ourselves, how do we mine this situation? It has created um, an intense level of volatility, um, uncertainty, complexity, and, and ambiguity. When I was public protector, I 
we ended up with a particular way of leading that was called epic leadership. That in times of volatility, it is important that you approach your challenges and your ecosystem with a leadership mindset that is anchored in ethics, purpose, impact consciousness, and a commitment to serve everyone. The last one is important because as long as there's injustice somewhere, there can't be sustainable peace anywhere. But that's not it all. That's not the only part of it. Is that the other part of it is just investment in everyone makes perfect business, isn't it? I know a business person who found out that this works. He's written a book, Everybody Matters, Bob Chapman. And it came by accident. He was at an event like this, but it was a wedding, and then he saw somebody handing over the bride and the, the groom, them starting this new journey. And then it occurred to him that actually everyone is someone's daughter, someone's son, someone's father, somebody's mother, sister, etc. And he started thinking, what if companies and countries will run as if they were families? So in your family, you invest in everyone, isn't it? You make sure that everyone is given a fair chance to make it. So what he did in his company was during the, two, uh, the 2008 credit crunch, many companies took shortcuts, as businesses do. They laid off people, last in, first out. And the company that was historically excluding certain groups, there's no gainsaying who gets off the boat fast then, because companies use last in, first out. So in a country like ours, for example, your women would be out <laughs> quickly, black people would be out, young people would be out fast. So you have an aging company with less infest out. So he didn't do that. Instead, they came up with an unusual approach to it, which many companies in South Africa did during COVID-19, that people would take unpaid leave for a whole month, and if it's your turn, you take unpaid leave so that nobody is thrown off board because we are a family. And it created such a good vibe that people often took leave for each other. If I know that you've got five kids and I only have one, they would take leave for each other. Or if I just know that your financial responsibilities are far more than mine. And Bob Chapman found that this created a spirit of unity. And it seems to me that that's the kind of spirit that kept humanity alive. People are beginning to dispute how we understood Darwin that we survived because of the survival of the fittest. There's a missing link there. That if it was the survival of the fittest, we would be dead by now. It was partly fittest, but a lot of it, a sense of community, a sense of humanity. Which you see in all of the species. You see the elephants, they look after each other. Here in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it was called Ubuntu. I am because we are. I'll look after you because my life and yours are intertwined. And if I look after you, I'm looking after myself. For Bob Chapman doesn't call it Ubuntu, but it's really the same thing. If everybody counts, that is Ubuntu. His company rebounded and did better than before the credit crunch. And currently, it's one of the most successful companies, the, the so-called Fortune 500 companies. Check that. So what does that mean for us and the opportunities that lie ahead of us? 
we are in the midst of adversity. We are in the process of trying to move out of it. So I am suggesting that there are three things that we need to look at. The first one is the growth mindset, where we have to let go of some of the things we know and explore new ways of doing things. We might fail in the new ways, but let's fail trying. Let's not insist that this is the way we've always done it. For example, we're always thinking, let's give people jobs. My experience with the women's groups, such as Fair Lady, Santum Group, now the women in, IC, women in, in tech, and the Tuma Foundation's enterprising communities, is that a whole lot of people are not looking for jobs. They have work. They're selling skills, they're selling products. What they need from you is not a job or an opening in your company. What they need is recognition. What they need are markets. They might need sometimes some mentorship. And you see that a lot of young people that have invented things. Uh, I, I spoke about Fair Lady, for example. Young people who decide, I'm unemployed, why don't I create, dial? One, one of them created Dial, a legal assistant, because she was a lawyer, was not employed. One young Tuma ambassador was annoyed with the amount of work they have to do as teachers in townships, like loads and loads of marking. And he figured out, how can I solve this problem? He created the marking app. He's not looking for somebody's job, he's looking for investment. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't help people with jobs. I'm just saying we need a multifocal lens. When we're looking at inclusion, we have to look at different ways of including people. Some are looking for land, uh, some are looking for capital, some are looking for markets, some are looking for mentorships, and some are looking for jobs, and we need to look at all of that. Lastly, what we also learned from Tuma, so, so we need a growth mindset. We need also an epic leadership outlook where you're always thinking, is this the right thing to do? And right is not always avoiding corruption or state capture. Right is also, would I do this to my daughter? when you make a decision. And this is something that um, the owner of Red's agency here in the Western Cape said, um, Pam Sneeman says, she makes decisions by just asking myself, would I do this to any of my children? If I wouldn't do it to my children, why would I do it to the next person? It's a golden rule, but flipped to a more realistic approach to it. So that's part of EPIC. But in our case, if we take Justice and Global's advice, it's just not enough to say, I will do this to my daughter. You also have to say, I, would I do this to my daughter if she were in the same position? Because we did inherit an unequal society. And if we want to be resilient as an ecosystem, we need to invest in everyone. We've seen it in countries like Denmark, Norway, etc. They are more resilient because they could leverage the strength of everyone. Our economy has been hit a lot, primarily because there were too many people that were on the fringes, especially when it came to the fourth industrial revolution. So inclusiveness would be part of our ethics. And of course, corruption is part of our ethics. State capture, abandoning state capture is part of it. Purpose, do everything in line with what kind of ecosystem am I creating? And uh, impact consciousness and committed to, to see. Just to end on impact consciousness, I swear this is my last story. I started by saying that we live in a world that requires brave leaders. You'll agree with me, we did not create these problems. 
but they are our problems now. If we don't solve them, they will solve us. But how were they created? My son, who is the managing trustee at the Tumor Foundation, says one of the challenges is the means justify the end. Remember Winston Churchill said, the world will never ask you how you did it. It will just ask you, did you do it? See, that mentality brought us to climate change, cross inequality, anger, fracture, and many of the challenges of our time. That mentality brought us stage four load shedding. Because some people, um, we are told by the rater, refused to obey a lawful instruction <laughs> to load shade at level two. But I'm not going to go into that. So what is that mentality? Uh, the story goes that there was a guinea fowl, that beautiful bird, unique to our country. It doesn't fly that high, it just flies a little, and the food had become scarce down there, just as resources have become scarce during COVID-19. And it then asked a buffalo bull how to get to the top of the tree where it could eat the best fruit. And the buffalo bull said, it's very easy, just eat my dung. And the little bit didn't like that idea, but the thought of getting to the top of the tree fast, and it could imagine itself eating the best fruit, it decided to go out to, to eat the dung. And it did eat, and zoom, it went to the top, and it ate. And then a farmer, and you can know in, in our area there's a lot of farming, a farmer passing by just remembered that he doesn't have lunch, and so the, the guinea fowl on the top of the tree went into his shed, picked his gun, came back, shot it, and had it for lunch. So what is the moral of the story there? BS can get you to the top very fast. <laughs> but it can't keep you there. So and we, we are not responsible for the BS that got us to where we are right now. Unfortunately, we're not dead. We've been spared, and we thank God for that. But we also thank the country leaders and other leaders in the world that have done their best to push back against COVID-19. And we thank every human being in the country and all over the world who are doing their best to mitigate COVID-19, including those that are subjecting themselves to vaccines. We also thank the health community for its plan. So my message to West Crow is firstly, you have come this far because I think you've done things epically. There's been some ethics in the way you've done things. There's been some purpose consciousness in what you've done, impact consciousness, and a commitment to self. We're now going through unprecedented times. As well as grows businesses, as universities, as the country. Let's just remember to spit out the lump of sugar, I mean the lump of salt. Let's remember to spit out the lump of salt in our mouth. And part of the lump of salt will be, who do we trade with? The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement has been open for trade for quite some time. Currently, indications are that intracontinental trade is not even at 20%. So this adversity that's COVID-19, maybe 
is giving us an opportunity to invest in creating infrastructure that will ensure that everyone gets on the full IR. Everyone has some kind of work, even if it's just working for themselves for subsistence. And that together, we lean on each other and we lean on hope so that we can get out of this maze. And I'm sure we're equal to the task. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Madonsela. I think that um, if, if you guys remember what uh, Professor Madonsela did as she served as the public protector of the country, you know that she's given Westgro quite a list of things that she'll be coming back for <laughs> and asking some questions about. But always a pleasure. Thank you so much. And you've given us a lot to think about. And of course, uh, Westgro has a brand new CEO who will charter the way forward now and talk about some of those opportunities that now lie ahead uh, for Westgro. Please, everyone, put your hands together for Westgro CEO, Ms. Renal Stander. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and with all protocol observed. Uh, <clears throat> so it is with a sense of pride and responsibility that I address you this afternoon. I feel privileged to have joined the Western Cape's broader leadership team entrusted with driving economic growth. Having spent most of my career working in both the public and private sector at a national level, I made a deliberate choice to return home to the Western Cape. It was inspiring for me to see how the Western Cape is making the most of unlocking opportunities and looking to economies of the future. I'm excited to play my part. Professor Madonsela, I feel particularly honored to have you by my side as I, debut, as I make my debut address this afternoon. To me and to many South Africans, you are a shining star. Your bravery, determination, integrity, in the fight against corruption gives South Africans hope. Thank you so much for choosing to spend the afternoon with us today. So the Westgra Annual Review holds a special place in the calendar of the Western Cape. It provides an opportunity to take stock and more importantly, to reflect on and anchor our goals for the coming year. For Westgro, the years, this year's Annual review, review gives us the opportunity to reset. The past two years have been particularly challenging and has Im impacted each one of us in some way or the other. Yet, there is a silver lining. The pandemic brought into sharp focus the critical role of business support ecosystems in the Western Cape economy, more particularly the importance of working collaboratively. The pandemic tested our ecosystem's ability to be responsive in a time of crisis. I believe this has forged a new, clearer and closer path for business and government to walk together as we rebuild our economy. As an agency at the heart of facilitating local and international economic activity, WESGRO is a critical part of this ecosystem. As Mike indicated, WESGRO very successfully pivoted to virtual platforms and continued to support businesses in the Western Cape throughout the pandemic. There is light at the end of the tunnel. The Western Cape is open for business. The focus right now is on recovery. It is so incredibly exciting to see the Western Cape economy restarting. Domestic demand is bouncing back and bookings from abroad are picking up. We are hopeful that our summer season will be saved as the global economy restarts. My dream is for the Western Cape to be one of the world's leading regional economies over the next 10 years. It was Maurice Maeterlinck, the Belgian-born Nobel laureate, who said, the god of the bee is the future. Similarly, Michael O'Malley, after observing his backyard beehive for many years, concluded that everything the bee does 
employs a future orientation as the basis for its actions. What is done today is always in anticipation of tomorrow. Bees are not short-term maximizers. Instead, their basic strategy is to maximize returns over a broad geographical area and extended time horizon. We know that the Western Cape has always differentiated itself by being a future-orientated economy. And now, more than ever, it is time to look ahead. So taking a lesson from honeybees, then, I invite you to dream with me for just one moment. Let us become the Rotterdam of trade logistics into Africa, the Bangalore of business process outsourcing efficiency, the Silicon Valley of tech startups, the London of financial services, the Western Australia of solar energy, the Spain of citrus exports, the Boston of health tech. We are already number two for citrus exports in the world. Why can't we be number one? We need to make choices, choices that will define a decade. As a province, we are at an inflection point. The lasting impact of COVID, climate change, inequality, aging infrastructure, and joblessness requires that the Western Cape forges a new growth story to successfully compete on the world stage. To succeed in a changing world, Cape Town and the Western Cape will be benchmarked against global competitors. This will be a tough competition for new markets, new investments, new skills, and technological advantage. As global economies are waxing and waning, our international competitors continue to strategize, make and enable investments. The pandemic has not stopped the clock on building the future economy. It has accelerated it. We cannot be complacent and pat ourselves on the back for what we have achieved so far. Our competitors are choosing to attract and unlock investments in the new engines of economic growth. Are we, as the Western Cape, agile enough to unlock the many opportunities opening up? It is no longer about improving our performance versus last year or relative to other provinces. Over the last two years, every country's strategy to win the future has shifted dramatically. We need to seize the moment. It's a terrible time to be poor at investment. We are living through difficult times. As a province, we have seen almost a decade of steadily declining growth influenced, amongst others, by unavoidable global shocks, a crippling drought, load shedding, and policy uncertainty at a national level. Notwithstanding the ever-present risks, short-term prospects for the province are markedly improved. Growth is forecast to recover by 3% in 2021 and by 4.1% in 2022. The growth opportunities for the next decade lie in AI, fintech, sustainable agriculture, health tech, pharma, renewables, and clean technologies. All these industries require new investment. This is certainly where large global economies are investing. It is indeed pleasing that the city and the Western Cape government are tuned in to these catalytic growth opportunities. The Western Cape made a deliberate choice to put business support ecosystems in place to grow the, eco the green economy and business process outsourcing. Today, we see a thriving BPO and green economy. 70% of all energy developers in South Africa have their offices in the Western Cape. This number is increasing as we speak. The BPO sector in the province employs 42,000 people and continues to grow. Similarly, the focus of the province on the digital economy meant that the Western Cape was well positioned for the step change required because of COVID. We need the same visionary orientation when it comes to, funding, to facilitating funding into growth sectors, enabling infrastructure, tackling inequality, and responding to ESG. Given the current constraints in the fiscus, should we not be much more actively attracting the private sector? In the venture capital space, for example, we see deals totaling 1.4 billion rand in 2020, of which more than half went to seed stage businesses in various industries, 
health tech, business services, fintech and software services. Are there ways that we can better rely on alternative funding sources with government priorities? The demands of investors have shifted rapidly. We need to be looking at in the same direction as the global economy. We need to be able to compete in a greener, cleaner and more sustainable world. There will be increasingly high standards for our businesses to meet, from agriculture to the build environment to transportation to manufacturing. Opportunities exist to meet these head on. The resolution of inequality needs to be part of our vision. Inequality remains a huge risk for economic growth in the Western Cape economy. It was Paul Romer, a Nobel Peace Prize for economics, who said, if you can't solve the problem of getting the majority of young people into work, it may not matter what other problems you solve. The services, agro-processing and tourism sectors have the greatest potential to absorb skills at a large scale and should be the focus over the, net, over the short to medium um, term. Turning to the tourism sector, Monica. The tourism sector in, in, in particular has great power for change. The last 20 year, months have demonstrated what an apex ind industry tourism really is and particularly so in a city like Cape Town. It's not only about the empty hotels and venues, but also about the food supplier providing fresh food to the restaurants, the flower vendor on St George's Mall, and the shoe shiner at Cape Town International Airport. Tourism has an extraordinary impact on the entire Cape economy. 70% of direct jobs are held by women, and importantly, provides exceptional opportunities for entrepreneurship. It has the power to uplift the economy as well as livelihoods in the province, particularly in smaller towns and rural areas. Tourism recovery needs to be front and center of the city, province, and national dialogue, and remains a critical pillar for the Western Cape economy. It is critical to get the tourism sector, as well as the industries that support it, working again. I'm happy to say, that we're already seeing signs of recovery. October saw the highest number of domestic and international passenger figures at Cape Town International Airport since air travel resumed. The Western Cape punches well above its weight in many key areas. It is already doing much to roll out the red carpet for investors and is working hard towards cutting red tape. Despite the difficult times, the Western Cape has seen a number of significant inward investments by global companies in the past 18 months, totaling about 5.6 billion rand. By facilitating exports into global markets, Westcrow supports businesses in overcoming local market constraints and bring much needed foreign earnings to our economy. Importantly, export growth during the pandemic demonstrated the resilience of exports to the sustainability and resilience of the Western Cape economy. And with a Westcrow team that was nimble enough to adapt to a world in lockdown, we are truly ready to usher in a new, much more digitized era of export promotion and development. Yet there's more to be done. With a sustained focus and commitment of all uh, stakeholders, I trust we can grow the economy of the Western Cape and become one of the world's leading regional economies. Just think how dramatically this will improve the quality of life and dignity of the citizens of the Western Cape. It is within this exciting context that Westcrow operates. Every morning, we get out of bed to make a difference to people's lives in the Western Cape. Using the levers at our disposal, we work hard to improve the dignity of the citizens of our province. The people of Westcrow, the people of Westcrow make the organization it is today. A big thank you to Tim Harris for the investment he made in the Westcrow team under the leadership of the chairman of the board, Mike Spicer, and before him, Professor Brian Fagaji. Over the last 40 years, Westcrow has refined its superpowers of aligning the city and province's value proposition operating as the interface between government and business, connecting the Western Cape to global opportunities through focused data-led business matchmaking, 
and facilitating private sector crowding in to create mixed funding sources. Within the context of a changing world, WESCRO will redefine and validate what winning means and ensure it remains a world-class tourism, trade and investment promotion agency. We will focus on what differentiates the Western Cape Valley proposition and our offer towards investors. Investors and exporters need to be at the core of what we do. We will continue to focus on how we strengthen our ability to convert more deals, leverage existing investments to draw in others, facilitate trade deals, strengthen relationships across all tiers of government, and work towards accessing private funding streams. In conclusion, the Western Cape already has many of the ingredients to be one of the world's leading regional economies. Well-coordinated public and private sectors, ability to attract world-class talent, local upskilling, access to capital, and a one-stop shop for investors all sit in one of the world's most beautiful biomes. Visionary leadership, acknowledgement that our competitors are global, collaboration across the business support ecosystem across the tiers of government, innovative responses to funding, finding ways to influence the pace of structural reforms to ensure energy and spectrum security, and importantly, a generous response to inequality are all critical success factors. I would like to leave you with one of my favorite quotes by Peter Kuzmik. Hope is the ability to hear the music of the future. Faith is the courage to dance to it today. I hope that we have stirred up your imagination. Can, you, can we hear the first strains of the music of the future? If so, the challenge is for us to go and dance the afternoon away. But we won't dance, we'll eat the afternoon away. I thank you. Please give our new CEO another warm round of applause. All the best with the way forward. I know that we'll all be watching very closely the steps that you take with Westgro moving forward. And I think. Um, very optimistic energy around you and I hope that it stays with you as well because I think that we've got the right kind of energy to rebuild and to keep going. We're going to break for lunch. Um, let's have a little meal and then we'll come back and we'll continue with the last part of our program. Um, uh, enjoy. We'll catch up soon. Um, former President F.W. de Clark has sadly passed away. Um, the news came out just, just under an hour ago. He passed away early this morning. He has been battling cancer. He's passed at the age of 85. If I could please ask that we could just have a moment of silence in his memory. Thank you. Um, we went back and forth with some of the organizers trying to figure out if we talk about it now or if we wait until the end of the event. And as we were discussing it, one of my colleagues outside said, um, were it not for former President F.W. de Clark, many of us would not be here together. And I think that that's something to really think about, that there's a contribution that was made there that made it possible for us to all sit here and path a way forward as a country, as a province, and as a continent together. And that, 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 that work needs to be acknowledged and forever uh, given glory to. Um, just as we continue with the program, I'm going to ask, please, that we have the um, MEC for Finance and Economic Opportunities for the Western Cape Government to give us a few words. Not the best way to start your presentation, <laughs> I apologize. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Perhaps to sort of, as you say, not the best way to start, but perhaps to lift uh, the mood. The, the after the event started off very well from, uh, for me when the mayor-elect, Jordan Hill Lewis, paid very sort of, uh, paid me a compliment by saying that he uh, really liked my new, more casual uh, look, <laughs> uh, which after preening for a few moments, I had to concede one of the side effects of the pandemic is I just simply <laughs> can't
cannot get into uh, my suit and my new chief of staff has me working so hard that I'm not able to go and, and buy a, uh, a, a suit. So the event started off very well. Let me begin by, by saying it's such a privilege uh, to share a, a platform with uh, Tuli Madensela because you were one of those, in your own words, brave leaders, a bright, shining light for all, all of us, doing the difficult things, doing the hard things when it was difficult uh, uh, for us and during a very difficult time in South Africa. So it is wonderful uh, to, to, to share a platform uh, with you. If we step back, I think we've got to concede that we have uh, been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course we all know has had a significant impact on both lives and livelihoods in the Western Cape. Too many people have lost their jobs. Too many people have lost their businesses and too many people are still struggling uh, to make uh, ends meet here in the Western Cape. The lockdown restrictions have had a devastating impact on the tourism and hospitality sector, which of course is the lifeblood of our economy in the Western Cape. And of course, to compound the problem, we have been hit by other significant shocks, load shedding, of course, taxi violence, and a cyber attack which almost collapsed operations at the port of Cape Town. But we are. We are a resilient uh, region, and although economic recovery will not be easy, we will reopen and we will recover in the Western Cape. What I think should uh, give us hope is that uh, we believe uh, that the economy will grow at about an average uh, annual economic growth rate of about 2.9 percent between 2021 and 2025 in the Western Cape. And that there are, as has been mentioned by previous speakers, significant opportunities for growth and for investments which will drive economic recovery in the Western Cape. Think of our agricultural sector boosting export growth. Think of our business process outsourcing sector, which was one of the few sectors which really created jobs last year in the midst of the pandemic. Think of our green economy sector. Uh, and few people know that of the 25 uh, approved bid window five renewable energy projects, seven of those approved projects with a capacity of about 785 megawatts are located right here in the Western Cape. And what is more, the most of the energy developers who won bids in bid window five are located here in the Western Cape. Think of our health technology sector. Two uh, health tech companies, Biovac and Afrigen, have both, who are both based here in the Western Cape and are both making strides in vaccine development, not just for South Africa, but of course for Africa and the world. Biovac, as most of you know, together with Pfizer and BioNTech, will tie up uh, to distribute COVID-19 vaccines to Africa. And to facilitate that process, there will be significant uh, technology transfers and on-site development and equipment installation at BioVac right here in the Western Cape. And AfriGen have been chosen to host the World Health Organization's first COVID-19 mRNA vaccine technology transfer hub uh, to scale up production and access to vaccines uh, for the current and of course, future pandemics. Both of these investments position the Western Cape as a center of excellence for biotech, tech, and medical research in Africa. And they illustrate, I think, some of the innovation and adaption during the COVID-19 pandemic that will drive economic growth and job creation in the Western Cape. And I love your idea, Renel, of uh, positioning us as the, the Boston of uh, health tech. Now, uh, James and I recently welcomed British Airways Flight 043 uh, at Cape Town International Airport, which for me symbolized uh, the rec 
recovery or the beginning of the recovery of tourism and hospitality in the Western Cape. I have to concede that there was a hilarious moment because, of course, James and I, wearing re reflector jackets, were mistaken for baggage handlers. <laughs> And the purser of British Airways ordered Councillor James Foss to assist a passenger with her luggage, which he did with a great sense of humour and great aplomb, and I really congratulate you for that. Of course, we've, we've heard wonderful stories of innovation and resilience uh, in the hospitality and tourism sector, but we've also heard heartbreaking stories of businesses that have closed, of jobs that have been lost and of business owners who've sacrificed their life savings to keep their businesses going and to keep their staff employed. Which of course is why we need to do everything uh, and ensure, as Renel has said, that we keep tourism front and centre of our recovery in the Western Cape. On the public entity side, Westgro will be working around the clock, restoring our connectivity to the world. British Airways has already arrived, but we're ready to welcome Virgin Atlantic and United Airways before the end of the year back here in the Western Cape. And of course, we are developing, the marketing team are developing an international destination marketing campaign, putting us forward uh, as the ultimate destination to get in a good space here in the Western Cape. Our department, under the leadership of Sali Fari and his team, uh, will be also working around the clock, eliminating obstacles to growth in the tourism and hospitality sector, including pushing hard to restore our triangular routes for international airlines and promoting visa reform and remote work visas here for the Western Cape. Looking, looking backwards, that we are in a position to reopen and recover, I think is a credit to the team at Westgro who have rolled up their sleeves and worked around the clock to maintain investor confidence in the Western Cape. Looking forward, we will be doubling down and doing everything we can to drive economic growth and job creation in the Western Cape. We will be focusing on five priorities. We will focus on ease of doing business, tackling those systemic obstacles to economic growth, like the port environment in the Western Cape. We'll be focusing on investment and export promotion, doubling spending on our destination marketing campaigns in the Western Cape. We'll be focusing on enterprise de development, making it easier to start a business, making it easier to scale up a business, and just making it easier to do business in the Western Cape. We'll be focusing on skills development, developing talent pools of young people who have the skills that business actually needs in the Western Cape. And of course, we will be focusing on energy resilience, powering up municipalities to, to generate, to sell and to buy electricity from independent power producers in the Western Cape. Because in the end, what makes our province difference is that we are open for business and that we back business here in the Western Cape. In closing, I'd like to uh, wish Renel Stander and the team at Westgro good luck in your search for, in the words of Turley Mudden Seller, better cheese in the Western Cape. Thank you. <laughs> It just gives us so much peace, right, when we know that um, economic plans by our government are led by someone with that much energy. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I'm going to, I know that uh, Mr. Mania has to leave us to go listen, of course, to the budget statement as it's, as it's delivered. I hope that as you get there, you're able to transfer some of that energy as well onto our finance minister. <laughs> It is his first budget statement, so we don't know what to expect. But thank you so much for that. A very amazing address. And then I'm going to call up now um, the former MAKER member for Economic Opportunities and Assets, Mr. Alderman James Foss. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you very much, 
to my colleague MEC Mania, that's a very hard act to follow. And as you've heard, I've been introduced as the former mayoral committee member. And uh, so maybe there is a career in baggage handling. Uh, so thank you very much for setting me up. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, coming fresh out of an election, uh, you'll agree with me that it's time for some political humor. Now, it's a pity that our mayoral elect uh, had to leave, Jordan Year Lewis. He's got an interview at the Civic Center, and you can imagine uh, the pressing agenda now. And so, but in his absence, I mean, we've just come out of this election, and it's been, and it's been tough. And uh, so what do you get if you ask a politician to tell the truth, <laughs> the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You get three different answers. I must say, I was, I was worried that if you didn't uh, find that funny, I came prepared, I came prepared. So a politician visited a community and asked, what are their needs? And so the community replied, we've got two basic needs. Firstly, we have a hospital, but there's no doctor. And so on hearing this, the politician whipped out his cell phone, and after speaking for a while, he reassured the community that the doctor would be there the next day. He then asked them about their second problem. Well, secondly, sir, there's no cell phone reception in our community. <laughs> right. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard from MEC Mania, those are the exciting updates and initiatives coming from the province. And uh, if I may say, it's even more necessary and smart to work as a team and in tandem. Now, a recent news article on MoneyWeb shows how corruption and red tape have devastated South Africa's manufacturing sector to the point where our economy is one of just 13 in the world, producing less than a decade ago. Now, it's only the latest indicator that shows the urgent and tough actions we must take to set the country on a different path. While in Cape Town, We've not been resting on our laurels, and we've really taken the time to carefully revise our city's economic strategy in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the related challenges. Now, if the issues that we sought to address could be likened to steep hills before 2020, they soon took on a different appearance of Everest high mountains with a pandemic that has marched on for more than 20 months. Now, Cape Town has in many ways been able to mitigate the effects of these crises, thanks in large part to the foundations laid of good governance over the years, as well as our superb partnerships with valued entities and organizations throughout the business ecosystem, such as Westcro. Our chairman, Mike Spicer, gave a broad overview of the previous year's achievements, but I want to make special mention of two very specific performances, namely Air Access and Cruise Cape Town. Now, as you all know, the city of Cape Town proudly provides funding to Westcro, and in particular for these programs, because it creates critical connections for Cape Town with source markets around the world to boost travel and trade, to benefit our economy in general, but more importantly, our local businesses. And so speaking from the city's perspective, we are very happy to see so many airlines returning, flight routes up and running, including the impressive lineup of more than 37 cruise ships expected to dock from next month onwards. So with more bums on seats and boxes in the belly, in other words, spending by tourists or investors and cargo for exporting proudly Cape Town products to the world, also ship maintenance and repairs, and don't forget the spending by crew and passengers, we will gladly continue to endorse these programs. Just this morning, I checked in with the staff at Cape Town International Airport, as I frequently do, Mark, who is the acting airport manager. And by the way, it's Africa's award-winning airport. Mark, let's give the airport a big round of applause. Now, it's no secret that I'm passionate about aviation, and therefore I'm very excited to share with you that we have 180 flights per day 
and 20,000 passengers processed per day at Cape Town International Airport. These stats are very impressive and clearly paves the way for a bumper tourist season. Before I continue on a personal note, I would also like to welcome Vrenel Stander, and I look forward to working with you, Madam CEO. You have inherited a fine functioning enterprise and together we have so much more to achieve. Now I know that for many, right now, various challenges, including the state of our economy, are causing sleepless nights. And so during my time as the mayoral committee member, whose portfolio includes investment and enterprise, I've seen what economic opportunity and a lack thereof means for people. And therefore I had to make sure if there was one thing I did before the end of my term, it was to piece together with the help of industry and policy experts a new economic roadmap for Cape Town and get it passed by council. Because there's no quick fix to our country's problems, also our cities around the country, but this refreshed, inclusive economic growth strategy was formulated with input from academic and industry experts and takes into account Cape Town's particular social and economic landscape. I can't tell you how many video calls and Zooms I've been in, but it was worth it to formulate this strategy as we work towards the goal of making Cape Town's economic opportunities much more accessible and much more inclusive. So this new economic growth strategy, it's bold and it's far reaching in its goals, yet meticulously plotted with nearly 200 deadline driven steps that will drill down into the detail so that we can meet the needs of those industries from construction to manufacturing as well as our informal sectors while simultaneously tackling those issues that's holding back these sectors from performing well, as MEC Mainier said, so that we can deal with those issues that block access to opportunities for so many people. So our approach as the city towards the economy is both broad and sectoral, because Cape Town is made up of diverse industries that provide a wide range of job and growth opportunities to so many communities from construction to call centers, boat building to clothing, green tech manufacturing, and through our business partners, the city has secured more than 12 billion rand worth of new investments in 2020, which was a very tough year for many industries. And therefore, a big thanks goes to our strategic business partners, including Westgro and Green Cape. Mike sitting here in the front, because as you know, green tech manufacturing as we've heard from our professor with load shedding and specifically moving the cheese around, that's going to be a big game changer. <laughs> that's going to be a big game changer for our city's economies. Because let's face it, it's going to be cities driving the national economy forward. And so therefore partnerships will become critical. And that's why I'm so happy to see so many people here today from different industries, from different sectors, because we need to work collectively. We cannot do it alone. That's why Cape Town's economy is so beautiful in its diversity. And so what you see here today, it's really an important reflection of how we will tackle our economy. Because one of my greatest pleasures is motivating for funding and support at every budget cycle of council for these high growth industries in Cape Town, specifically our strategic business partners. Because where in your wildest dreams did you think you would see a city government launch and fund strategic business partners? But here's the thing, it works. We are seeing the results with 50,000 people now employed in tech, hence Cape Town's Africa Tech Capital, and 60,000 people employed in our call centers. In fact, so great is the worth of Cape Town's tech and call center sectors that the city has become a major draw card for business giants as Amazon, which will be setting up its new headquarters here in Cape Town. And equally, our investment efforts into newer markets, such as green technology manufacturing, are paying off, with a local industry set to be worth approximately 110 billion rand by 2035. Cape Town has already begun capitalizing on this growth via the new Atlanta Special Economic Zone. And it's locals from the area who stand to benefit with training in manufacturing in wind, solar, waste, and water technologies. Because these are invaluable skills. We need to prepare Capetonians for the future jobs. 
and specifically because these will become sought after work in industries that will be dominating the energy production landscape in just a few short years from now. I also understand that a myriad of issues from load shedding, unreliable public transport, a failing rail network, high data costs, really affects everyone from the business owner to the intern to the unemployed youth. And that's why economic recovery efforts must take into account the global village in which we operate. We're also making it easier for SMMEs to survive, very, very important part of our city's economic landscape, because in tough pandemic times, we need to make sure that we pay them. 100% of city supplies are paid within 30 days and being accessible to help with the ease of doing business. Over 4,800 inquiries from SMMEs were serviced by the city's business hub because this is a key interface with SMMEs launched in August of 2019, with 99% of service requests actioned within two working days. We will also continue to work with partners such as Productivity SA, which trained almost 900 businesses through supply development and smart procurement programs. Because of these programs, we have helped and we will carry on helping young businesses compete and source for big business. Also to make Cape Townians job ready, we will be making 55 million rand available as the city for the Cape Skills and Employment Accelerator program so that we can train and do work placement in the clothing and textile and call center sectors. However, we have much work to do in creating further access for unemployment or for people that find themselves in a situation where they can't find a job because of the lack of training. And so I found in my interactions with businesses that one of the biggest struggles is sourcing the talent and the skills that they need to maintain and grow their business. And therefore we've launched a Jobs Connect program that will connect job seekers with the appropriate or available job opportunities. And if they don't have the necessary training, we will make them job ready by providing them with that training so that we can really make that unemployment queue much shorter by not just simply training for training's sake, but providing Cape Townians with the right training for these high growth sectors. And so under this initiative, over 55,000 people have been registered and assessed and 15,000 trained in work readiness and almost 5,400 people have been placed in jobs during this cycle. So these are just a few of the programs and specifically making sure that skills become that game changer because the professor made a very good point. It's not only about jobs, it's also about skills so that we can really provide more opportunity for people, whether it's access to markets, product development, making people market ready. And that's why these programs really need to open those avenues because behind all of these statistics are real people for whom these jobs create dignity. And this is why we must work harder than ever to help the people of Cape Town and South Africa to be ready for the opportunities that lay ahead. Now on the subject of innovation, and as you all know, I'm always on the lookout for ways to enhance economic participation and also broaden the commercial scope that will give entrepreneurs and businesses that competitive edge to help grow their products and to gain market access. And so with this in mind, I'm excited to share with you our most recent initiative called Made in Cape Town. And so we've joined forces with the Craft Design Institute and other stakeholders to promote and develop the many things that have a Cape Town origin. And I'm happy to announce that the first private sector entity to pledge its support for the Made in Cape Town movement is the VNA Waterfront, because supporting small creative businesses in that space becomes critical as we create those pipelines of more opportunity for people to get access to market. And so the Retail Readiness Living Lab program provides training and mentorship to foster retail expertise and readiness as the economy ramps up. And so on the subject of ramping up, it really gives me great pleasure to also reflect on our tourism trends and many speakers have referred to, to what's happening in that space. But the city of Cape Town has also launched our destination marketing campaign in three of our key source markets recently, namely Munich, London, and New York, giving content on our six pillar communication strategy, namely to position Cape Town 
as a preferred destination to visit, explore, study, work, play, invest, or quite simply live. And it's really heartwarming to see an upsurge in bookings and inquiries from travelers and tourism operators. And we are also now exploring Africa. And I've heard previous speakers refer to this because it is absolutely critical for us to see Cape Town as a springboard into Africa so that we can help Cape Town companies to expand, but also to create those critical connections with other African cities on the continent. And so we will be looking at our city to city agreements and partnerships with more markets across the continent because we've also built a very successful connectivity already through air access to many of these markets. So it would make sense now to use that springboard initiative to actually boost travel and trade both ways and that we can position Cape Town as a proudly African city. And the teams working in the department and at our agencies will know that I always speak of conversion because if you market and there's no conversion, there's no return on investment. And so really it's important that we convert potential travelers and investors into actual visitors and investors and see more people making bookings, visiting our city, investing in our businesses, because it's those bookings that really benefit our local businesses. So ladies and gentlemen, it's only not one industry that must benefit because tourism really influences retail, transportation, accommodation. And so when people come here from the other side of the country, continent or world, they don't come to only lie on our beaches or go up the mountain, or those, those are reasons enough, but they really buy the products of local companies. And it's really through travel that a local delicacy becomes a global trend. A design goes from Kailicha's streets to London catwalks. Investors witnessing the potential of green tech manufacturing in Atlantis, really curious to come and sign on those dotted lines, and therefore it's important that we draw on the inspiration uh, of our business ecosystem with all the partners present, and that we also acknowledge the work that Westcra has done to bring us all together so that we pull together, and therefore it was a great pleasure really to work with Westcra and also to acknowledge their work, their contribution, and their impact. Because from tour guides in Langa to boat builders in Woodstock, to Athlone call centres speaking to clients in London. It has really made clear the passion that for growth it exists and it simply needs to be unlocked. And that's why we are really proud funders of Westcro and all of the partners involved so that we can really pull together and get the best return on investment so that we can make Cape Town that go-to city in Africa and globally. Let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then, of course, I'll welcome onto the stage now Mr. Rashid Tupi, who's the DDG for Economic Operations. Thank you so much. A warm round of applause for him as well. Thank you, Naledi. Yeah, it gives me a, it's a pleasure to just say, to do a quick wrap up and say a vote of thanks. Um, I'm not sure if all of you have been captivated by Damien Galgut's prize, the Booker Prize. It's, it's been amazing. I've been kind of caught up in it. But it's scary when the whole world's eyes are looking at our, at what, yeah, it's an extraordinary story, but it's a focused on our troubled land. You know, there's a book that's landed that, that shines a light on that. And I think today speaks about the kind of hope that we need to project when the rest of the world sees our sort of troubled story, if you like. Um, so today, it's just wonderful to see you all back. I mean, for me, the energy of face-to-face -face is incredible. It, what a difference to not be switching off mics and just seeing you all um, blank screens. So this has been amazing. So Mike, thank you as chair for steering the ship in the time as well between this, I'll, I'll say between the Tim and Ronell era. And um, you spoke today about the uniqueness of this agency, you know, the, the multiplier effect uh, of each of our productive sectors. Um, and at the heart of that is employment. I think if we summed up everything we do here, it's, it's a four letter word, it's jobs. You know, we can, we can couch it in all sorts of other things, but that's what we get out of bed with, for, which is what Ronell said. And then, um, Prof. Marincella, you, I mean, we, we all know you're our, our example of an ethical leader, but today we could see you're quite the storyteller. So we went from salt and sugar and cheese to guinea fowls, and it was memorable. I don't have to capture everything you said, but 
What, what really stuck with me was something you said right at the beginning, which is this, this importance of us growing together and making, um, mining the duality of our diversity. And it's, it's such a vivid image. And um, yeah, you also said we need to, gr we, to grow, we need to let go. And um, as, we, as everyone's been sort of anecdotally saying, what are we going to either stop doing or focus on to, to do things differently? Because I think we have moved beyond even a VUCA world. It's, it's, that, it's that absolutely new, um, it's a world where, where mining that youth dividend becomes even more important. And then Renel, I mean, I, the moment is not lost on me and it shouldn't be on anyone else that, that Westgro after 40 years has its first woman CEO. And I think it's a big deal. And um, so, so Renelle, yes, indeed, she was born and bred in Cape Town. But to be fair, she's been honed and sharpened up in Joburg. And <laughs> as someone who's married to a Joburg, I'm, I'm looking forward to the sort of can-do attitude that you're going to bring to this place. Not, in, not, nothing against all of us Cape Townians who, who get up and work a bit and then go watch the sunset. But I think, I think watch this space for, for the... The, the, the energy that you're going to get out of this Joe Burger um, and a Joe Burger based chair as well. Well, not, you know, Mike, Mike comes from that same attitude. But, you know, Ronelle, you really outlined the importance of the, for me, that full value chain um, and, 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 and the sort of faith and hope that we need to create by, by, by actioning each point of that value chain. So while I, everyone knows your mandate is to get out there and attract business, I think it's very clear that you see the raison d'etre behind it all, which is about, which is about fixing the inequalities and, and that we can't grow if we don't tackle those inequalities. And then our minister who had to run off, I think everyone has to go log on to the MTVS speech. Um, yeah, min minister is, he's got that kind of energy. And I think if you all don't know, he is our minister of finance. So if you, he's not only the minister for tourism and economic development, but he's also the Western Cape's minister of finance. And he brings that sense of focus on priorities and on what are the five things we need to do. And um, yeah, it's, remember, it's not just better cheese. It's, it's what can we eat besides the cheese. So, And then the other baggage handler was, was <laughs> ex-former <laughs> Alderman Foss. I mean... If you're not a baggage angel, you could do the comedian thing as well. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're, I hope you're back in some form back at the city because you have brought a kind of energy there. And the, the partnerships between city and province really has been unprecedented. Maybe COVID forced us there, but we ended up forgetting about the silos and the little who reports to whom. Everyone who needed to be in a Zoom meeting was there at the drop of a hat and just got stuff done. And so... Yeah, you spoke, to, you spoke about bums and boxes and boats and techies. <laughs> and so I'm trying to keep it short, but those are some of the highlights for me of your speech. And then I have to do the thank yous um, to the mayor-elect who was here. Thank you for being here. Members of the Western Cape government, our whole team, our HOD, Mr. Faree and Joanne and, so and, and Ilsa for the work you do to support Westgrove to achieve what it does. Members of the Westgrove board, I can see a few of you around. Um, the Westgro executive team as well, Yao, who kind of really also held the ship together when, when in those last three and a half months. And then importantly, colleagues from the diplomatic community. I, I sat at the table with our US, German, and British co um, colleagues, so thank you for being here. And then with all of these events, they never just happen seamlessly. Believe me, it's more than a, than a simple click Zoom meeting. Monica, to you and the marketing and comms unit, or your entire unit, which is... Jean and Carmen and all the other people you see running around who make, who make it look smooth on the surface with frantic paddling underneath the water. This was an awesome first event to be back, you know, face to face. And um, I'm going to end with a, with a speech and then at the end you can, you can guess who, who made this, um, and a speech, a quote, who, whose quote this is. But it talks about hope. And this quote is, hope is that little spark that gives you faith in the possibility of a future that seems unattainable. And that was Tuli Madunsela's word, so thank you. Thank you so much. The perfect way to round things off. Everyone, have yourselves a wonderful afternoon, and I hope that you will continue the conversations after this as well.